Hey everybody, welcome to Roughing the Pundit. I'm TJ Carpenter, and every week we're going to talk about what happened over the weekend and the past week in sports and get you ready for what's coming up this week. Of course, joining me as always from Dallas, Texas, it is the pre- and post-game host on 105.3 The Fan for the Dallas Cowboys, Ari Temkin. And from Kansas City, Missouri, it is Joshua Briscoe, host of Almost Entirely Sports on ESP in Kansas City. Gentlemen, how are you today? Usually Ari goes first there, guys. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I kind of wanted Josh to go first since his Chiefs lost in the AFC Championship game. My condolences to you and your Chiefs, Josh. It was a valiant effort, but the underdog story of the season and those New England Patriots that nobody expected to do it actually did it this year. Yep. Yeah, those plucky little underdogs really showed the big baddies of the Kansas City Chiefs who haven't stopped winning for the last 20 years. You're totally right. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Well, let's start there. The Rams and the Patriots are going to be representing the NFC and AFC in the Super Bowl. Do you guys like this matchup? Uh, uh, let's start with you, Josh. Uh, obviously, you're closer to the situation than Ari or I are. Uh, do, do, do you think that these are the two best teams? These are the two most deserving teams to be in the Super Bowl? That's an interesting question. I would. I mean, I think most deserving is kind of by default, yes, because those are the two teams that made it through all of the sludge. I would have rather have seen the exact inverse. Uh, I'd rather have seen Chiefs versus Saints because I want to see the two best quarterbacks. Tom Brady is great at the overtime game-killing drive. Jared Goff is great at, at being uh, the marionette of Sean McVay. I would rather see the exact inverse with the two better quarterbacks this season, uh, the MVP battle and everything. It's a fine matchup. We've just seen a lot of the Patriots, so forgive me for being under-enthused. I imagine the Patriots probably win because they usually do. The Rams would be a fun story, bringing all of these outcasts in this offseason, making a Super Bowl run. It's already a good story. Um, I'm, I'm underwhelmed, but they're, they're probably the two best teams. Yeah, neither of these teams are deserving. I mean, are you kidding me? The Patriots, I mean, they're, they're synonymous with the Super Bowl. Like, it's crazy that the Super Bowl's been around for 53 years, and if they win... On Super Bowl Sunday, they will tie the Steelers for most Super Bowl champs, championships of all time with six. Like, they're not deserving at all. The The only thing the NFL is deserving of is to not have to see the Patriots in the damn Super Bowl again. And for the Rams, they're not deserving. They just got to L.A. like 10 minutes ago. The last thing the L.A. fans need is another winner after being in a city for 10 minutes. So it should have been the Saints and the Chiefs and the, the Chiefs' long-starving fan base and the Saints... Kind of long, starving fan base that hasn't really done much throughout the history of the NFL. And look, I think in one respect, we saw a horrible, horrible no call on a penalty really impact the outcome of the Rams Saints game. And then, of course, everybody wants to debate the merits of the overtime rule, which in the last, I don't know, five years, they changed the overtime rule. Nobody brought up the fact that if you score a touchdown in the first possession, the opposite team doesn't get a possession. But yet, because the Chiefs' poorest defense, which couldn't stop anybody all year, couldn't stop um, the the Patriots in their first possession. Everybody starts to complain now that Patrick Mahomes didn't get an opportunity. Everybody wants everybody everybody wants everything to be fair now because Mahomes didn't get a chance. Well, I mean, I personally like the college football overtime rules where everybody does get a chance. Uh, I don't know if you would. Uh, I don't know if the NFL would ever adopt that because the games would end up lasting a lot longer than uh, they did, and that would obviously uh, uh, cause a lot of injury concerns. But I do think I do think it's interesting here that um, you know the the Patriots were able to take advantage of a porous Bob Sutton defense. Uh, Josh, let's start there. Is Do you believe that's the reason why the Chiefs lost this game, or is it more complicated than that? Does it have something to do with the 60 yards that they lost on four plays in the first half? Yeah, so it's more complicated than that, but I think that's the main reason, no question. The Chiefs didn't score in the first half, which is, like, totally insane. That never happened all season. They never got shut out in the first half. Um, some points in the first half would have been really nice. they probably win if they have even an okay first half. But the offense did its job in the second half, especially in that fourth quarter. Even as the Chiefs scored an unbelievable amount of points in that fourth quarter, it was largely helped by the Patriots getting the ball and also scoring very quickly, giving the ball back to Mahomes. The Chiefs' defense kept the Chiefs from having even a chance in that game. Uh, it's really, really hard for me to, to wrap my head around the idea that, that Mahomes was so good in the second half, the offense was so good in the second half, 
and then you don't even get a shot in overtime. Not because of the rule, but because they could not stop Brady on third and ten. I believe three different times in overtime. That's that's that lands firmly on the shoulders of the defense. All right, so on the other side of things, the Rams and I know a lot of Saints fans uh, have a gripe with the officiating in that game, but there were also some questionable calls there by Sean Payton, Ari. Uh, I thought that the Rams were the deserving team. I thought they were the better team in that game. Um, certainly Sean Payton uh, put himself in a situation where that call, that big no call on the uh, pass interference uh, ended up hurting them. But uh, also the, the three plays leading up to that play, that no call, uh, were big mistakes by Sean Payton, no? Well, first and foremost, I gotta ask you both. Sean Payton's pants, are they too tight? Sorry, Sean McVay's pants, are they too tight? Oh, impossible. He can't wear pants too tight. He could be wearing body paint on the sidelines <laughs> and it would be perfect. I'm not gonna lie, his package makes me highly uncomfortable when I watch games. Um, but yeah, I, I, what I found maybe most appealing, most interesting was the referee like that was standing right there on that fateful play on the third down where they don't call I don't know one of the four penalties they could have called in that play he just stood there showing the incompletion sign like you were looking at it and you did how did you not see that he speared him before the ball even got there like you were staring right at it like that's insanity that you didn't see it now look I'm always of the belief that officials should never decide the outcome of games insofar as, like, you have to make plays in order to overcome bad calls. You do. You can't put it on the officials. And look, the Saints are no different. They had a, they had a possession following that possession that they didn't score, and then they had a they possession overtime where they turned the football over. So they had two possessions, and all they had to do was score once out of those two possessions, and they win the football game, and they don't, and then afterwards they complain about the officials, which... Rightfully so. Now, I also have to mention that there were like three um, face mask penalties that were not called um, that could have gone the way of the Rams. Or so. Look, I, I just it was it was a horrible no call. It was clearly impacted the outcome of the game. They should have had a first down with an opportunity to score a touchdown in that possession. But they also had two subsequent possessions after that and still didn't score in those possessions. So at some point, you have to put it on your team to be able to put those points up and win the game. Yeah, well, and you know, look, point, I, I think that we, uh, we we got the two best teams here, and I certainly think that uh, the Saints, maybe this is a little bit of the universe evening things out. I mean, it's not like the Saints have ever done anything dirty or uh, or um, maybe did something to cheat the game themselves to get to agreed. the Super Bowl. They have uh, never and done Sean anything. Payton, after the game, said he was on the call with the league, saying that the league had no idea how they missed that call. I wonder if Brett Favre was on that call. What do you think, guys? Bounty Gate was the dumbest. It wasn't not only was it not cheating, it's it was the dumbest scandal in the history of dumb scandals in the NFL. Just just based on the fact that if you are a good pass rusher and you injure opposing quarterbacks, you are going to benefit from it financially. Meaning Julius Peppers, when he signed a huge deal with the Bears, hurt Matt Stafford in the first game the Bears ever played against the Lions so badly that he missed basically the entire season. That gave the Bears a strategic advantage in advantage in winning in the division that year. So whether you call it bounty gate or not, it's the premise of the entire NFL. If you're a if you're a, if you're a defensive player and you you go and and hurt a quarterback or injure that quarterback, whether you mean to or not, you're going to give your team a better chance to win. And you're going to you're going to get bigger contracts worth more money. Bounty gate was stupid. The the Saints should be in the Super Bowl because they should have uh, they should have gotten the right call there. Well, certainly there were there were more than enough good calls, bad calls, uh, good plays, bad plays in both of these games to, to where it could have gone either way. That's why we had two overtime games. First time that's ever happened. Both the highest scoring uh, high scoring games in uh, I think it was the highest scoring fourth quarter in AFC Championship game history as well. So uh, I was really excited. It was one of the best weekends of football I've ever seen, and uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it. We'll break down some more specifics of these two games and everything else going around the NFL uh, coming up next here on Roughing the Pundit. Welcome back to Roughing the Pundit. I'm TJ Carpenter. Alongside me is Ari Temkin from Dallas and Joshua Briscoe from Kansas City. Gentlemen, let's start off with the controversial no call in the Saints game. 
Uh, of course, the Saints fans are very upset about it, but I'm I'm curious whether or not you guys think it's actually that big of a deal, especially given the fact that the league has been so stringent with protecting players. There was, uh, it, was a, it was kind of a blindsided hit. It did look like there was helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact on that hit. Uh, it seemed like a pretty vicious hit and a, and a pretty significant no-call there. Ari, how significant is this, not just for the outcome of the game, but for how things are officiated in the playoffs in general? Well, I'm not really sure the fix. You know, I've kind of thought that maybe – you know, team, they should kind of revamp the entire uh, challenge rules and allow you to challenge penalties, to be honest with you. But I understand the pushback on opening that can of worms. I mean, I think you basically have to do some sort of a format where, you know, you you, you can review all turnovers and, and touchdowns and then give coaches, you know, whatever it is, two, if it stays with two, but allow them to also um, challenge penalties or non-penalties. I mean, I think that's got to be a part of it. There's... You know, pass interference penalties are spot fouls. They're, they're significant, so I think you need to give coaches the opportunity to challenge those. And, I mean, I think in this case, um, you can certainly do the same thing. But I, I, just, I just don't know. It's such a – you know, football exists it, it's as a sport in a gray area in terms of what's a catch, what is it a catch, all these different things that are so hard to, you know, to, to, to say clearly what they are and what they aren't. So I think, you know – Every year we see this happen in the playoffs. It uncovers a new flaw in the entire process. And so we try to legislate to that. I mean, again, obviously it played a role in the income, the outcome of the game. But, again, they had two possessions after that to try and score and didn't and threw an interception in their first drive in overtime. So all you had to do was was put together a drive in overtime to win the football game, and, and instead you get intercepted. So, you know, again, you hate – that officials play play roles in the outcome of games, but even in the Des catch non catch year, you know there was a role of you know the Cowboys coaches not blitzing Aaron Rodgers enough. He was just on one leg, and they didn't get after him enough. Um, Cowboys probably left too much time on the clock the year after. So it just seems like every time there is an official that makes a mistake that impacts the outcome of the game, regardless of how late in the game it was, there's always moments in that game where you could say, well, they could have done this, they could have done that, it would have been different. So at the end of the day. You, you, you as a team need to make sure that you don't put the fate of your team into the hands of officials, and I think the Saints did that. And I really didn't like Sean Payton after the game basically being like, yeah, yeah, the league already apologized, and basically went on and on about how, how important that call was. And then... All you know, and then and then do the whole. But I mean, you got to give credit to the Rams. They made the plays to win the game. And it's like, but you've just completely diminished any credit you gave to the Rams by the soliloquy you had on you know bringing up the the, the call itself. So I think you just kind of invalidate the the Rams' point of view and the Rams making the plays down the stretch to win that game, which is the truth here. Well, you know, Josh, the last time we saw a play that was this significant affected by the officials in the playoffs was a few years ago when Des Bryant's catch, no catch against Green Bay occurred. Uh, that started a whole slew of NFL rules revisions because of how impactful that no or that call, no call was in that game. Do you think we'll see something similar as a reaction from the league here? Yeah, I, I kind of do. Um, my optimism is, is limited at this point. But I've been calling for some NFL refereeing reform this entire season. Uh, and one thing I think we can look at is the fact that we've got, we've got the ability to go from the field to Mike Pereira and back again before the refs make a call very, very right. frequently. So here's what you do. You, you, you let the refs on the field throw their flag and then immediately back in the booth, wherever it's at, let refs travel. There's a ref in the booth that gets to watch on replay, and at least on the penalties that are 15 yards or more. Like, this is a very small one, but the Chris Jones roughing the passer call against Tom Brady in that Chiefs-Patriots game, where he literally slaps him on the shoulder pad, that is a clear and egregious missed call, as was the pass interference in Ram Saints. Calls like that go up to the booth immediately, and then the ref in the booth can just say, hey guys, I just watched it, pick up that flag, that is not a penalty, that is not a penalty. It means refs need to be a little easier with throwing the flags. You've got to throw that one against the Rams and Saints anyway. You can't throw a flag from the booth, but you can pick one up from the booth in the system that I'm building. I think it's the best next step. It's not uh, it's not Medicare for all, but it's uh, you know it's a step between the two. If you'll make a little political analogy, you've got to take a step. Whatever that end goal might be, you want to be able to fix it for the long term and for everyone in that analogy. 
you've got to take a small step first. So have one of these head refs, take most of these older refs perhaps, that are having a harder time keeping up with the speed of the game in 2019, move them up to the booth, put them up with the coaches, and let them pick up flags from the press box essentially with their monitors from New York if you must. I think it'd make more sense to have them travel to the games though. Let them pick up flags from the booth. So that Chris Jones penalty, that is egregious. You can pick that up in 10 seconds. That is an easy call. If it takes more than 10 or 15 seconds to pick up a flag, then it's not easy enough to pick up the flag on and you just keep it moving. That's what I would change immediately. He did slap him really hard, Josh. It was, it was, was a pretty a really hard, hard slap. slap, yeah. And I don't even know if he was wearing shoulder pads. It could have really hurt his shoulder. Yeah. So, I mean, I didn't disagree with the call at all. It was probably the right call. Um, I, Josh is absolutely right, by the way. Like, I, I don't understand why it takes so long to review a play when, I mean, Gene Steratore, Mike Pereira, any of these guys that are that are being employed by these teams um, ha- have those calls almost immediately. Like, how do you not have somebody in the booth in real time that's evaluating these calls in real time and make sure that these calls are right? That, that's that's what we need. And I, again, if this if the idea here is the calls just need to be right, well, then, then we need to have somebody that's in real time understanding yep. these calls are wrong or right. First of all, also really quick, really quick, well, TJ, guys, I'd like to I apologize. Just, they didn't hear it, but seeing me sneezing and blowing my nose right now, it's not because I have a cold, it's because I'm allergic to bad refereeing. Just wanted to make that canonical. <laughs> guys, I just don't know if the NFL can afford I'll, that kind of yeah, expansion. Yeah, let's, let's squeeze that money uh, the, out. I mean, things are pretty tight around the league. <laughs> All right, okay, but so guys, we have a young way, coach in you Sean McVay, a young amusing. quarterback in Jared Goff, a young running back in Todd Gurley. Uh, are the are the Rams the best young team in the NFL? They've made a Super Bowl here. Uh, it's, it's pretty impressive what they've done in a relatively short amount of time, but Josh, I'm guessing that you may have another candidate for the best young team it's in the really NFL. It's a really good question. I would argue that it's the Chiefs. Here's why. The most important thing, the thing that carries the most weight is the quarterback. And the Chiefs have, by far, the better young quarterback. The Rams have some advantages, certainly. And having Aaron Donald is really good. Having Todd Gurley is really good. Sean McVay and Andy Reid, you can make that argument however you want. Seeing how McVay and his offense performs against Bill Belichick will be fascinating. Uh, to, to, you know, sort of solving that argument of who the second best coach in the NFL is. Belichick is one. I think right now Reid and McVay are probably fighting for second. Uh, Sean Payton has an argument, I suppose. But... I think the Chiefs have the better argument by just a hair because it's the quarterback situation. And you look at the fact the report came out this week that the Chiefs are going to make Patrick Mahomes the highest paid player in the league after next season as soon as they can uh, afford to extend him. Even if he performs poorly next year, I would imagine, or more poorly next year, I would imagine they're going to give him a big contract because the longer you wait, the higher that number is going to go, the less leverage you have as a team. You look at Sammy Watkins and his deal. He'll, he's got a three-year deal, but it's pricey. The, the uh, aging and declining Eric Berry, we'll see how he performs after an assumed surgery this offseason. Justin Houston is, is up there. So you look at the age thing, but you also look over at Aqib Tlaib in Los Angeles. No spring chicken, but they do have Marcus Peters, but his season this year has been a bit of a disappointment. It, there are lots and lots of ups and downs. A guy like Tyree Kill and Chris Jones are the ones that sort of tilt that scale for me, looking in favor of the Chiefs, where Mahomes is the biggest advantage, and as they're pretty neck and neck elsewhere, I'll go with the quarterback. They're not even that young. The, the youngest team in the playoffs this year were the Dallas Cowboys. They're the second youngest team in the NFL. Uh, the Chiefs The Chiefs have a young quarterback. Mm-hmm. Tyree Kill is young. Damian Williams is young. Chris Jones Chris is Jones. young. Yeah. But... I mean, and same with the Rams. I mean, Sue is older, but I don't know. I I guess I agree with 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 Josh's pretty simplistic assessment, which is they're younger at the better position. Yep. They're not. Sorry, the, I'd take Mahomes over Jared Goff, right? I, I'd take Goff with McVeigh, but Mahomes uh, in a vacuum is a better quarterback. Therefore, I'll take him. But the Cowboys were the youngest team in the playoffs this year, the second youngest team in the NFL. They've got a great young linebacking core in Leighton Van Der Esch and Jalen Smith. Who, who are just just scratching the surface of their potential. You know, Dak Prescott as well, going into year four, I think he really played well towards the end of the year. And he, he's, you know, in, in line to make a major jump next year with an overvamping, with an overhaul of their roster, or with an overhaul of their offense. So let's also not forget about the Dallas Cowboys as well, who are legitimately young and not just young in terms of their quarterback. 
Shocking. The guy from Kansas City thinks it's Kansas City, and the guy from Dallas thinks it's yeah. Dallas. That's Tell us about uh, Case just Keenan, remarkable. TJ. Uh, how, how, how about the Patriots? How, how <laughs> what about the Patriots? They're a good young team, too. <laughs> the, the Patriots are, I, I don't know how, I, I mean, Tom Brady's eternally youthful. Right. I don't know other, any other way to explain how, how they're still he's kicking. He's 41, um, but he's but like I actually say this, just six. The Dallas and... Cowboys have a lot of young talent, but their coaching staff is just fossils. Not Jim Fossil, actual fossils. Yeah. fossils. So they're so old in the coaching staff. they got to upgrade that before they uh, can really, I think, be considered state-of-the-art. Um, all right, guys, coming up after the break, we're going to talk a little bit more about Drew Brees deciding not to hang it up. Is that a good call or a bad call? That's next here on Roughing the Pundit. Welcome back to Roughing the Pundit. I'm TJ Carpenter, and of course, alongside me is Joshua Briscoe and Ari Temkin. Gentlemen, it's time to play a little good call or bad call. Drew Brees, who is uh, 40 years old, says he is not retiring. A lot of people thought he might retire after the season was over. There was a lot of speculation about that and whether or not it would impact whether Sean, uh, Sean Payton would come back as the Saints head coach. Drew Brees says he's coming back. Ari, is that a good call or a bad call? It's a bad call. I mean, he's 40 now. He's coming off easily the worst year of his career. It's clear the game has passed him by, and he's just hanging on for dear life, right? I mean, <laughs> it's a lot of athletes don't know when it's time to go, but for Drew Brees with the – I'm sorry, what's that? Oh, he's an MVP candidate and had like 100,000 touchdowns this year? <laughs> yeah, it's still a bad call. He should retire, and then Sean Payton should go coach the Dallas Cowboys. Josh? Good call or bad um, call? Drew Brees retiring or not? It's it's a good call unless you're Sean Payton just because he has to hold off his lust for Taysom Hill for another year. Like, that's been the weirdest thing in football. That I occasionally, know. Occasionally, Sean Payton puts in Tim Tebow and takes out the second leading <laughs> candidate for MVP on the season. Like, let's legitimately, it's Tim Tebow. If Tim Tebow was used like Taysom Hill, he'd still be playing football. Um, as long as he was with the Saints, because that's the only team that's doing that. It's really strange. Um, no, but it's the right call. Like, if he wants to keep playing football, which is obviously it's pretty easy to say, well, it's up to, to Drew Brees. If he wants to keep playing football, it's a good call. He'll still be a, a top five quarterback until the moment that he's not and when his arm falls off. But you look at you look at a guy like Drew Brees and Tom Brady uh, and even to some extent Phillip Rivers, guys who games who, whose games translate pretty well as they age, not so much of Ben Roethlisberger, who I think we're seeing the significant decline of. I think Brees could do this for three or four more years if he really wants to. Okay, all right, next up on good call, bad call. Tom Brady, before the game against the Chiefs, was pretty adamant that nobody believed in them and the odds were stacked against them. Personally, I think this is probably the worst Patriots team of this dynasty with Tom Brady and Bill Belichick. I think it's pretty impressive what they were able to do with very little around them. Despite the fact that they have a phenomenal track record, this is not a very good Patriots team by comparison to all the other great Patriots teams, and yet they still made it to the Super Bowl. Good call or bad call, Josh, that Tom Brady is playing the victim card here and saying that nobody believed in the Patriots. It's an embarrassing call. It's like it is. I I am embarrassed for Tom Brady and Julian Edelman because they've been playing up this underdog thing. I will say that this might be the most uh, I would I don't know the most impressive coaching job and 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 building up of an offense by Josh McDaniels in his time in New England. Obviously, with Tom Brady and Bill Belichick being huge parts of it, also. But the fact that they did this so differently this year, I think is absolutely worth crediting them. Uh, running the ball as successfully as they did in, with everybody, with all the way to, to Rex Burkhead all season. Sonny Michelle, as good as he was all year, throwing the ball to James White out of the backfield. The way that the offense worked and Belichick always having something defensively, it's an incredibly impressive run for the Patriots. But they are not the underdog, literally ever. They're the team in the movies that eventually that young plucky upstart team beats did not happen this year. Will never happen. Yeah, I mean, look, they did it with, you know, they did it with a, a traditional blocking tight end, uh, making some big plays for them. Uh, Gronkowski or something. I mean, he's not, not has never been a huge part of their offense or a big playmaker. Uh, what was it? A, a first round draft pick at running back for 113 yards and two touchdowns. I mean, who, whoever could have seen this coming with such bad personnel? It's, it's really remarkable. And 
I mean, incredible that they're having such a bad season despite being top 10 in both points per possession offense and points per possession defense, one of only two teams in the postseason, the other being the Chargers, to actually have that. So, yeah, what a bad season for them despite the fact that they're one of only two teams the entire NFL to be top 10 in points per possession offense and points per possession defense. They really are a great underdog story. And, yeah, this is an impressive coaching job by Bill Belichick to take a team that's always good – and good again this year, even though people don't want to believe they are, and fight the narrative that they aren't as good to say that they are as good as they always are, despite the fact that people don't think that they are. But they are, and this isn't the worst uh, team that they've had throughout this run. It's probably one of the better ones, even though we believe that it is one of the worst. Guys, I, I think part of what's going on here is that we are so conditioned to believe that the Patriots are the best team in the NFL. The second that they don't look like the best team in the NFL all season, uh, you know, people are so ready to bury this team because they're tired of the Patriots. I think that yes. is a big reason why the media is so quick to write off the Patriots early on in the year. They're so quick to pick other teams, and it just fuels the fire, man. I I'll be honest, you know, Tom Brady. Tom Brady did not play well against the Chiefs, I thought. I did not, it was not a great game from him. He had one touchdown, two interceptions. Uh, you know, He had one rush for negative yards. Uh, he was, I think, 30 of 46. It wasn't a great day for Tom Brady, and yet, when it mattered most, he was Tom Brady, though Tom Brady we all know and expect in the postseason. And, you know, there, there ha we have to give some credence and some level of appreciation for seeing him do that in a season where he didn't look as good as he normally does. Um, speaking of which, uh, it looks like Vegas has corrected all of their doubts of the Patriots. Uh, they're favoring them in the Super Bowl over the Rams. Josh, is this a good call or a bad call? It's the right call, and they weren't correcting anything. The Chiefs were a three-point favorite at home. It would have been an even game on a neutral site, and the Patriots would have been favored by three in New England. And it would have played out about the same way in any of those three venues. I don't think this is Vegas correcting a mistake. It's just the right evaluation here. You expect Bill Belichick over the course of two weeks to build a defensive game plan that will limit the Rams for at least a little while. And then if it's close at the end, I'll take Tom Brady and, and anyone. I'll take Tom Brady and James Devlin over Jared Goff and Todd Gurley. That's, that's what the, the, the odds makers in Vegas are saying. We'll take Brady in crunch time and we'll make, we'll make the best of it outside of that. Also... Devlin absolutely destroyed Reggie Ragland on the game-deciding touchdown, which should tell you all right. you need to know about Reggie Ragland and why the Chiefs' yeah. defense struggled so much. They couldn't stop the run even when they knew it was coming. And that was like, you look at that Devlin clear out on the, the final rush of Reggie Ragland, it's like you're the linebacker that needs that needs to fight off a fullbacker block. Like that, yeah. that can't happen, Reggie Ragland, and that's... Not good. With apologies to you, Josh, that's the problem when you have not only Bob Sutton, but also Reggie Ragland and Anthony Hitchens as your linebackers. Yep. Sorry, All right, Josh. coming up after the break, it's Say Anything, where we literally say anything. That's coming up next here on Roughing the Pundit. All right, final segment here on Roughing the Pundit, it's Say Anything. Ari, let's start with you. What do you have on your mind? What I find so amusing what I find extremely amusing is every single year I engage with the game companion during playoff football that is Twitter. And every year I hear the belly aching and the awe-inspiring, just absolute disbelief, incredulous nature of people on Twitter for the missed calls or the bad officiating or whatever it is. And every year, everybody comes back. There is nothing that people love more than complaining about the NFL and yet still consuming the NFL as a product. It really is the most amusing part of the entire playoff experience. Watching on Twitter as everybody complains about bad officials or you know, questionable moral ethics or whatever it is, whatever it is, everybody has a complaint about the NFL and they sit there and they watch games and they still watch games and they still just complain. It's just sitting there and complaining and not actually do anything to either fix it or walk away from watching the sport that causes you so much ire and disbelief. So I will never stop being amazed by the people that sit there on Twitter and complain about the bad calls, whatever else it is, and still watch. 
Stop watching if you're so, if you think the calls are so egregious. If you think the lines are that thin and the margins are that thin and your team lost because of the stupid call or the missed catch, no catch, or the bad missed call for the Saints, then stop watching, stop buying tickets, stop buying a product. Because until you do that, all you're doing is belly aching and being noise from the crowd. Very interesting. Uh, yes, and I think you're absolutely right. We love complaining about officials. There is no doubt about it. Josh, what's on your mind? Mine's also officiating related. I didn't know where I was going that direction, but I'll go another direction with it. The NFL is not out to get you or your team. I'm sorry. I know this is hard to hear, uh, but it's true. NFL referees are not uh, trying to beat your team. They're not trying to get an L.A. New England Super Bowl. They're not trying to get in Drew Brees or Patrick Mahomes. The Super Bowl is going to be fine, however it is. The playoffs are going to be well-viewed no matter who is there. Good quarterbacks are usually going to get you there, so it's going to seem like perhaps the NFL wants there to be good quarterbacks. They just end up there. That's how this works. I don't think the NFL is totally losing its mind over getting Tom Brady in the Super Bowl for a billionth straight time. NFL rep referees are not and have never been out to get your team. They're just not very good. I've given you the solution for next year. If the NFL takes my advice, we'll have guys up in the booth who can immediately pick up a flag, immediately overturn a bad call. Hopefully that happens. I would love to see refereeing reform because this season was especially painful. In that regard, we'll probably see a painful moment in the Super Bowl in a couple of weeks as well. But just know they're not out to get you. They're just not very good at their jobs. And also remember, Denny Parkins is a douchebag. <laughs> Well, uh, finally, I, I just wanted to say that uh, I, think every, I think everybody needs to just take a step back and realize how remarkable Tom Brady is. I know that a lot of people hate Tom Brady. I know why they hate Tom Brady. I know why you hate the Patriots. I know that they don't like cheaters, but cheating wins. Cheating, cheating gets, <laughs> gets the job done. I'm pro-cheating, but that's not what this is about. Tom Brady has figured out a way to be the ultimate underdog story every single season. He was picked late in the draft. He's been to nine Super Bowls now. That is incredible. He's going to his ninth Super Bowl in large part because he knows how to, he knows how to play well when he doesn't play well which is exactly what he did in the AFC Championship game. He did not have a great statistical game. He did have 348 yards, but it was a one touchdown, two interception kind of night. And if D Ford hadn't lined up offsides, it would have been a three interception kind of night for Tom Brady. But when it mattered most, he figured out a way to get it done. And that's how you define greatness. Not how good you are when you're at your best, Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs, but how good are you when you, things aren't going well? How good are you when you're not that good on that day when things aren't going your way, when you're not getting the calls. Can you still find a way to win through great adversity? And no one in the history of sports, perhaps, is better at that than Tom M.F. Brady. So I think that we should all just appreciate the greatness of Brady and appreciate this Super Bowl because it might be his last. I don't know if it's going to be his last. I don't know how much longer he's going to play, but I think we should all appreciate him while he's yes, here. Yes, we should appreciate Tom Brady like we should appreciate a gunshot wound to the head. <laughs> I'd also like to point out briefly that that analysis completely hinged on D. Ford being lined up offsides. And if he was lined up <laughs> onsides, none of what you just said would have been would have made any sense literally at all. How is he supposed to know where he's supposed to line up, Josh? It's not like there's an actual D4 line there. lining up offsides. That's, that's how that evaluation was made. Good work, yes. everybody. And Kansas City, be mad at D Ford. Don't be mad at TJ Carpenter. <laughs> well, the, they, they can be mad at both of us. Uh, we, we know that's true. If you're on Twitter, you know that they can be mad at both of us. That's going to do it uh, for us here on Roughing the Punnet. want to thank everybody for watching once again. Don't forget to follow us on social media, facebook.com slash watchphantom, and at watchphantom on Twitter for Joshua Briscoe, Ari Temkin. I'm TJ Carpenter. Later, y'all.